adults, and people will stay up, but you know, about one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, people start tapering off and going to bed. But Mike and I never do that. We stay up until the time comes up. So, so, so we, we got this reputation, right? And so we we we, we got this name that Mark has, has <laughs> called the Relentless Astronomer. We're always up late. <laughs> anyway, okay. So so y'all are going to be the presenters on DSS on Destination Solar System, right? Okay, so tell me something about where you're from and what your backgrounds are. So and your names, because we'll learn. We're, we're going to be friends, right? Yeah, we yeah. are. <laughs>
you start off though. Um, my name's Chris. Uh, I, yeah, I was, um, my new guy was in visual arts. Okay. Um, I studied abroad and painted and, uh, drew and I love that world. Um, and then I went to grad school for acting. Um, and, uh, I grew up in Oregon. So okay. I think there's a lot, and I slept out under the sky every summer night. I'm from Oregon. Oregon. I, yes? Where? Yes. My, uh, folks lived in the Grand. The Grand. Okay. And I was an undergrad oh, yeah, in, I was an undergrad in Oregon State. So. Okay. Wow. Okay. Great. A lot of great sky out there. Yeah. Well, I was uh, just like 20 minutes south of Portland. Okay. Like southeast of Portland. Okay. Um, and uh, so I love it out there. I love the space. And I also like just yeah. I, I grew up looking up at the sky and uh, sleeping under the stars and, and loving you know shooting stars and being able to see the Needle Dipper and uh, and there's Omzi out there. Yes, and I grew up going yes, to Omzi, which is. Adler reminds me a lot of different parts of Omzi, and so it geeks me out so much coming here and being able to work in here. <laughs> because I literally, like, if I could, every day of summer, I would want to go to Omzi. What is Omzi? The, it's at, like, the Museum of Science and Industry. Oh, cool. So, uh, it's the Oregon, Oregon Museum, Museum of Science and Industry. Yeah, it's <laughs> for Oregon, yeah. But, okay. yeah, but uh, doesn't Chicago have something similar? Yeah, it's called the MSI. The yeah, right. The MZ. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So. Right, so it's like the Oregon version of that. Cool. Um, yeah, so... So this has been, this, uh, the hidden scientist in me that, like, loved biology growing up and uh, just never pursued it as a uh, you know, professional career, okay. comes alive every time you're doing it. Um, it's funny because it's been dormant for so long. Yeah. Uh, and it's always down there. Though. It's always down there. Well, Becky has it, too. So <laughs> like, uh, she's like an artist who plays the top, but then also geeks out about the stuff, too. Oh, good. Okay. Okay. <laughs> And then every now and then you're going to get some crazy ones, right? 
And, and, and our goal here at the Adler is for everyone to always feel completely um, comfortable saying, you know, I don't know the answer to that, but I have some friends downstairs who do. <laughs> and then you should instantly come to my office or send me a text or grab one of the other astronomers, and they'll be able to help you answer the question. Or our historians will be able to put out the collection or who knows what. Okay? And so part of what we're doing here is uh, just making you guys comfortable with the whole fact that that chain of uh, learning exists. And if you should never, ever hesitate to just come in my office and say, what the hell is the deal with Pluto? Right? And we'll talk about it. Right? We can do all of that on the spot. So um, my email address is there. Um, I'm a night owl, as I just told you guys. So if it's before 2 AM, I'll usually answer you. Um, and if it's after 6.30 AM, it will get answered roughly when I get to it. So, but, um, but, but usually I'm up and I'll answer you if you have questions. So if you wake up in the middle of the night and like have a panic attack about quasars or something, just send me an email and, and I'll answer you. So, um, that's my blog there. So I blog about science there. You can go read about all kinds of different things. I blog about all kinds of stuff. Um, uh, lots of it's related to astronomy. So if you just wander around and make these and stuff. Um, and I'm slowly building my, my, my life on Twitter um, because it seems to be a, a necessary part of communication in the world. So that's me. Yeah, I'm Science Jedi. So, uh, so you can so you can find me on Twitter there, and I'm still still developing that. So, okay. Um, so we're going to meet with four or five times over the next few weeks, and because the content of the show is mostly about the solar system, I'm going to focus mostly on the solar system. And um, you know, there's there's we could have a whole course if you guys know about astronomy, we could meet every day for 30 days and still not talk about everything, right? So we're not going to talk about galaxies and well, we can't, but we're not, I'm not planning on talking about black holes and galaxies and dark matter and you know, all that sort of stuff, because it's not germane to what you're going to be exposed to every day. If you want to talk about that, we certainly can, but my plan for the five weeks, at least, um, is, to, is to focus on just the solar system stuff that, that, that you will probably encounter the most. Um, if we could touch on dark matter and, and black holes. We can talk. absolutely talk about any of that at any time. Now, one of the things that we started when I first got here at the Adler, and we, we kind of we stopped, and we're going to start again, is we're going to, uh, we had kind of classes for the staff. And so we did that. We were doing that once a week when I first got here initially, and I think we're going to go back to it. But we're probably going to do it like once a month so that everyone can kind of make it on a regular schedule. And certainly you should be aware of those, and when that starts again, then we'll do that. But but we can absolutely talk about uh, the training stuff as well. Sir? Yeah, there should be an all other email. We just switched to the new email system, so I don't know how it's all working yet. But yeah, um, part-timers have not been in it so far, right. but that was one of the original plans, was that yeah. they would get Adler email get addresses. Adler. So right. um, yeah. I've been kind of waiting on that because right. they're still setting things up. Okay. Well, anyways, but that's right. We're all in the core together now, so, so you guys will definitely hear about it when okay. we get back to that. But, but absolutely, you know, as we get deep into this stuff with the solar system, we will reach a, reach a wall where we talk about everything that I think we need to talk about. If you guys want to talk about anything else, just say so, and then we'll talk about it and start something crazy mm -hmm. stuff. So, so at the very end today, I, I have a slide. I'll tell you what we're going to talk about. And then you guys can tell me if that sounds cool to you or if you want to hear about something different. Okay? Okay. So, so, so let me, um, here's what we're going to do today, right? I want to talk about what we can see and how far away everything is. Right, so one, uh, one uh, you guys, you've all read the script at this point, right? You're practicing, right? Because it's coming up soon. So, so one of the. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but I want to talk about how far, because as you know, one element of the script is that we have the space jump drive, and of course, in reality, getting around the solar system is not as easy as we make it seem in the show. So, I want to talk to you guys about how far away this stuff really is, and how we normally think about it. But people may ask you because they'll see on the floor and, and ask questions. So, I want talk to you guys about that. So we'll focus mostly um, on the solar system and, and do that. Um, eventually, I'll put, uh, I'll put all these slides on my website here. This, this isn't actually up yet. Um, I just made that up today. Um, but um, I'll put it up, uh, get it all set up. And so starting next week when we meet again, um, everything will be up there. So if you want to get these slides and read them on your phone while you're eating lunch at the Hancock Center or whatever, you can, <laughs> you can, uh, you can get them and do it. OK? So let me tell you a couple things about me. Oh, yeah, and this is this is the only thing I require of all of you, which is if you have any question at all about anything, just ask. Okay, now, um, I'm not going to have you guys for an entire semester like I normally do for my students, but by the end of the semester, my students all know that this is the only requirement I ever have of any of you. So you should just feel comfortable. There's no question that is out of bounds or too dumb or, I mean, 
you guys aren't astronomers, right? And we're trying to impart all the knowledge that I might have in each of you, and the only way we're going to do that is if you tell me that was confusing, I didn't understand that, I heard this, I read this, my aunt Edna asked me this, whatever, okay? So just, just ask, and we'll, we'll figure out what we need to. Okay? Okay. Okay. So this is me. So I grew up in Colorado and Oregon. Uh, this, is my, this is my scientific selfie, so if you ever need a picture of me, this is the one you should use. Um, I lived in Montana for about 10 years, so I really kind of think of Montana as home. It's the state I kind of identify with the most. Um, I was there for graduate school. Um, I was a professor of physics for about seven years at Utah State University before uh, we moved here. Um, and then as Mark said, I'm now at the NASA and, and Northwestern University. Um, I work in something called gravitational astrophysics, which means I spend my whole day thinking about black holes and neutron star binaries and you know what happens when white dwarfs crash into each other and, and crazy stuff like that. Um, I'm married, I have a, an eight-year-old daughter and three cats, um, but please tell everyone I only have two because my partner thinks I only have two. So, <laughs> so there's, there's my blog again. Um, I build and use telescopes, so that's my telescope there on the, well both of these are my telescopes. Um, so I built both of those, that one on the left is called Equinox. Um, it's a 12-inch telescope. So uh, if you go up on the floor in the telescope gallery, you'll see telescopes about that size that um, Herschel used and you know, early telescopes that were about that size, that virtually everything in the solar system that's historical was discovered here. So you can see the moons of Mars with a telescope that size, I've seen Pluto with that telescope, um, you can see asteroids, you can see craters on the moon, you can see the rings of Saturn, the moons of Jupiter, everything. You built the whole thing? I built both of those, yeah. How do you build a telescope? <laughs> <laughs> that is a entire lecture, <laughs> but no, it's not hard, right? So so the one thing I don't do is I make, I don't make mirrors, although people do. Um, when I got into telescope making, someone had given me a kit to make a mirror, and so I worked on it and slaved away for like six months and then I broke it. And oh. So I'm like, never again am I ever going to make a mirror. <laughs> so now I just build all of this, and you know, you just cut it out, bandsaw, and screw it, glue it all together. So, yeah. so so, so it all comes right, apart. Right. These, these, these poles come apart, they break apart, um, and the whole thing collapses down to a box about this big. You just throw everything back to the truck. So oh, wow. Did you build the inside? The door. The and the mirror. Yeah, I built the mirrors down here. Oh, okay. okay. Oh. And in here, you can't see in here, there's another little mirror that's about this big. Okay, so all the light comes into the telescope, hits the big mirror, it comes back up to that little small mirror, and it shoots it out the side right there, and you look in right there. Oh. So you like, stand on something to look inside? Yeah, this one I have to use a ladder. So when this one's pointing straight up, it's 9 feet at the edge. So telescopes are like reflectors, basically. <laughs> these, are, these are called reflector telescopes. Okay. So that's a special kind of telescope. The other kind of telescope is called a refractor. And that's the kind of classic one that you see everyone looking straight through. Okay. It's just glass that you look all the way through. But these have mirrors down the bottom. What's the difference in the, in the It's just a mirror or using a magnifying glass to gather light. So the whole, the whole goal of a telescope is to take all the light that covers a certain area and focus it down into a little spot that's big enough to go in your eye. Okay? And so this one uses a 22-inch mirror, so all the light that hits that 22 inches gets focused down to my eye. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, a, a telescope that, like Galileo used, that you can see up on the floor, they're about this big, but all of that gets focused down to your eye. And so that means you can see a lot dimmer thing by using a telescope. Okay? So, so these are my telescopes. This one's called Cosmos Mariner, or Mariner. So uh, if we do a star party, you'll you'll probably see Equinox. Um, Mariner's in Utah right now because I need a trailer to move it. Don't have a trailer yet. So she, she's big. Yeah, she, it's it's a big monster. So so when we go to star parties, right? This is what we do. We take these out. So cool. And we do star parties. I do want to like check out these other telescopes they've made. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, that's yeah. so cool. <laughs> so so we, there's you know there's design awards for the night telescopes. Say, you tell there the, yeah, yeah. And in the afternoons while we're waiting for it to go dark, we have telescope walkabouts and we all walk around and everyone tells everything about their telescope. Wow. So so my telescopes stand out on the field usually because most people are very enamored with this kind of natural wood. So almost yeah. all the telescopes like this you see they're just you know polished birch wood. But I'm almost the only person who puts any color on mine. So mine, mine have this green, this green stain on the yeah, wood, which makes them really <laughs> pretty when you stand out on the, on the field. So, so anyway, so those are my telescopes, right? <laughs> so that's, that's my backyard in Utah that I used to be in, right? So I had uh, really dark, I could see the Milky Way from my backyard. It was, it was awesome. Wow. Not, not in Chicago, though. No. I'm also a Lego maniac, right? So this is my, I have, um, I have about 450,000 Lego awards. Are you a member no. of uh, Lego Land? Are you a, like? Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> 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 How many times have you seen the Lego movie? Wow. Okay. Yes. Uh, how many 
Yeah, you can just zip it out. <laughs> <laughs>
were certain there were planets at all. And I mean, we've all seen Star Wars and Star Trek, right? We know there's we know there's other planets where Darth Vader and everyone hangs out, right? But but we didn't know that as scientists. The only planets we knew about were here in the solar system. Until '94. Until '94. And in 1994, we found the first planet, not around another star, but around the skeleton of a star called the neutron star. Okay, so when a star goes supernova, when it explodes at the end of its life, it forms a black hole or a neutron star. And a neutron star is something the mass of the sun, but squeezed down to the size of Chicago. Okay. And so we can see these things in radio light. And, and in 1994, we saw one, the exploded remnants of a star, and we could tell that it had planets orbiting around it. Okay. Now, since that time, we've discovered planets around all kinds of stars. There are currently 2,000 planets uh, are known around other stars outside the solar system. Okay, so you and I right now are living in that time in human history when we're first discovering planets around other stars. Wow. And we've always suspected it, but we didn't know for sure. Wow. But we are. Okay? And so right now, you know, we're discovering them at a rate of 5, 6, 7, 10 per week. It just kind of depends. Yeah. So, but uh, the exoplanet catalog, what they're called exoplanets or extrasolar planets, it's, it's climbing every day. So, so we're up around 2,000. But until 94, these were the only ones we knew about. And so consequently, these are the ones we know the most about. And so we're going to talk a lot about all of these different planets, and we'll, we'll focus in on the ones that we know you guys are going to visit in the show, um, just so you have some, some knowledge to you know, back on your life when you go. Okay? So this is how you always see the solar system drawn in pictures, right? Okay, so you guys know the order of the planets? You guys know all your planets in order? Yeah. Okay, what's the closest one? Mercury. Mercury. another discussion for another day. So. Oh. Okay, but this is how you always see it drawn. Okay, so let's ignore Pluto for a minute. So what's the biggest planet? Jupiter. What's the smallest planet? Mercury. Mercury. Okay. Okay, what's the planet that's closest in size to Earth? Mars? Yeah. Mars. Earth. Venus. 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 Oh. Yeah. yeah, so in terms of size, Venus is almost exactly Earth's twin. Oh, okay. oh that's in terms of size. Okay. But Mars, right, Mars is the one we always think of. Okay? And so, so the reason, we'll spend a whole day talking about Mars. Okay? But the reason people think Mars is because of all the planets, Mars is the only one whose surface we can see through a telescope. Okay? So it's the only one we can see through a telescope. We can see the surface and watch the clouds and see volcanoes and you know, all the stuff. It's Mars is the only one. All the others, Venus is completely shrouded in clouds. Mercury is far too small to see through a telescope from Earth. Um, these are all gas clouds. And so Mars holds our attention because we've been able to see its surface for far longer than any other. Okay, so we'll spend a whole day talking about Mars uh, when we do this. Okay, so this is how you always see it drawn. Okay? And in reality, the solar system is much, much larger than this picture gives you the impression of. Okay? So one of the first things I do uh, in my astronomy class on day one, so this is day one for you guys, is we build models of the solar system. Okay? So I'm gonna have all of us do this. Oh my god, I love this class! <laughs> <laughs> I can make it homework, but we won't do it. Okay? Awesome. So you can take this home and hang it on your wall when you're done. Oh, yeah. And 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 you can, you know, use it to impress your Uncle Bob when he comes over or when your mom asks you what kinds of cool things are you doing in your new job, this is the stuff that you that I you want do. Chris okay? To draw mine. Okay? okay, does everyone have a pen? Uh, I brought a few pens because I I didn't know if you'd have there's, uh, there's markers. And there's markers. Oh, markers? I see markers. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Everyone grab a marker. And pen. Okay. Now, I'm not going to make one because I have one hanging over my desk, which you'll see when you come back. I love Chris's Can I have one? <laughs> you want one more? He's have you done this with us before? No. Oh, you have? Okay. I love this exercise. So, so this is, this is, there's, there's, there's this very odd observation about the solar system, about the spacing of the planets. Um, we don't think there's anything meaningful about it. It's just something that we've noticed called the Titus Bode Law. And it's it's just this kind of relationship about the space and the planets. And so this exercise Titus is kind of law? the Titus Bode Law, right? After these two guys in the um, And so this is exercise is kind of based on it, but when we're all done, 
your, this map that you're about to make of the solar system is very accurate. I mean, to within a few percent. Um, and so, so that's why I like it, because you don't have to measure anything. You just kind of work it all out, and, and it ends up being the perfect map of the solar system. Okay? Ooh. Okay, so on one end of your piece of paper, I want you to mark, mark it and label it as the sun. Okay? And don't make the sun too huge, because we're, things are going to get squished down there. On the very on end? On one end, I want, on the very end. Just label it? Just label it. You can put a dot, and when we're all done, you can... So on mine, at, mine over my desk, I have pretty plants drawn on all of it. Right. You guys can do that for me. <laughs> okay, so on one end you put the sun, okay, and on the other end I want you to put Pluto. Do you want us to draw like a planet or just write it? Just write it right now. Yeah, you, you can just write the name. Um, you don't have to draw a picture of the planet if you want to. Okay. Now I want you to fold your piece of paper in half. So this yes. is what mine looks like. See, I have pretty pictures drawn. Yes. So you guys can do that. Okay. Fold it exactly in half. Okay. So this is why you don't have to measure everything. Because the whole thing's going to be based on folding, right? Okay. Can I crease it? Yeah. Go ahead and crease it because we're going to use the mark for reference. Okay. Now, that, that fold is halfway from the sun to Pluto. Okay? So what planet is exactly halfway between the sun and Pluto? Mars. Jupiter. Jupiter. Okay? So, so if we look at this picture, right, Pluto's right here. It's not on this map. But Jupiter is halfway in between. Okay? So that's what you would think. Okay? But it's not actually right. Aha. Okay? It's Uranus. Whoa. What? what? <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> so on that fold, I want you to mark your this. <laughs> That's the point, right? You guys see that picture of the solar system all the time. Yeah. yeah. And it's misleading, so right? <laughs> it's so far away. Okay, so now take Pluto and fold it to the mark that's Uranus. So halfway between Pluto and Uranus is what planet? Oh. It's Neptune. <sighs> okay. Because you guys told me the order, right? So you knew it was Neptune. Of course. Of course. Okay. So, so look at your map so far. We haven't finished the whole map yet. Okay. But half of the space taken up by the solar system is Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. <clears throat> Fully half of the solar system doesn't have squat in it. <laughs> I mean, it has, a, it has, we'll talk about this, right? It has asteroids and comets and, you know, all those kinds of things. But there's no planets out there in the other half except for Neptune and Pluto. Oh, wow. <laughs> now, this is Pluto's farthest? Yeah, this, this is this is Pluto's semi-major axis. Okay. Okay, so it's right. it's the average of its oh. axis. And, yeah. So so yeah, planets planets orbits are are not perfectly circular usually. Right. They're they're ovals. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so those ovals have a close point to the sun and a far point to the sun. So yes. for most of the planets, the oval is almost a circle, but for Pluto, it's really an oval. And so what Mark was asking is, what number did we use? It's the furthest part. Yeah. yeah. And so there's kind of an average number that we use okay. called the semi-major axis. Mm -hmm. It's kind of halfway between. So that's what we do. Does it vary by like a lot of miles? Uh, for for different depending on how oval shaped it is, it can vary tremendously. Yes, absolutely. And I don't know the exact numbers for Pluto. We can put it on the slide. So, but yeah. okay. Okay. So now I want you to take the sun and fold it to here. Planet, do you think we're gonna put there? Earth? Uh, Jupiter. Mars. Mars. No. Mars. It's Saturn. You. Saturn. Saturn. Okay. Okay. Now, look, Saturn is freaking far away. Okay. 
how long does it take a space probe to get to Saturn? Forever. Twelve years. I mean, two years. Yeah, <laughs> no longer than two. So it took seven? it took Cassini seven, I think. Seven. It took Voyager like four. It's close. Okay. Seven. Seven. But Saturn is one quarter of the way from the sun to the edge of the solar system. It's pretty close to the sun on this map, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, you guys are going to visit Saturn in the show, right? Yeah, okay. Absolutely, yeah. So when you go, to, in fact, Saturn's as far from the sun as you get in the show, as I recall. Isn't that right? Yeah. Saturn is the farthest Pluto. Okay, so we're never getting farther than a quarter of the way to Pluto on this map. Oh, wow. People should ask for their money back. They thought they were going to explore the whole solar system, right? But we're confining our attention down to this little small part. Space jump. <laughs> I know, you got the space jump. You can go wherever you want, right? Yeah. Okay. okay, so now fold the sun to Saturn. Oh, man. Another <laughs> trick. Okay, who's that going to be? Mars. 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 Anyway. Jupiter! What? <laughs> <laughs> Jupiter! Okay? J one eighth of the way mm -hmm. from the sun to Pluto. Right? Oh my Pluto is hugely <laughs> far away. Jupiter is way close compared to Pluto. You guys are going to Jupiter in the show, right? Yeah. This is going to get so folded up again. <laughs> That's right. It's, it's going to get corner. totally folded yeah. up. Right? <laughs> okay? Okay, what are we going to do? We're going to hold the like sun like to Jupiter. Okay, and we're not going to do Mars yet. We're going to do something that we skipped over when we listed the planets. What did we skip over? Do you guys know? Stones. Oh, the asteroids? Oh, yeah, the asteroids. Asteroid belt. Best, is, best is one of the asteroids. The asteroid belt. Okay, so that's the asteroids. And I, I put a little Millennium Falcon in mine. <laughs> yes! <laughs> that's awesome. Okay. It's got to land on one of them. <laughs> we are. Do you guys know that? So we have landed on an asteroid. We'll talk about this in a couple weeks. But we're, we're sending the, the new plan is to send a mission to an asteroid to land on. Really? Mm -hmm. To and in fact, to try to figure out how to like disrupt its course? No, no, to land on it. Land yeah, on. But there are those of us who talk about how to disrupt its course. That's right. a whole other story. Right. Um, and in November, thing. we're going to land on a comet. What? What? Are you kidding me? in like a robot? on the moon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's called Rosetta. Yeah. 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 We, we, the human race, yeah. our robots. Yeah. 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 It will actually become the Rosetta. Mm -hmm. Wait. Wait. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> yeah, Rosetta, it has these big hooks. It's going to grab it. So oh. Because they're afraid it's going to fly off. Right. Yeah. We'll talk about that. Right. <laughs> That's my job. Okay. So now, what are you going to do? You're going to fold the sun to the asteroids. And then finally, we get to Mars. 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 Okay, <laughs> but look at, look at, right, when you mark Mars, look at that map, okay? Mars is really far away. We've been talking about going to Mars as humans, right? We sent robots there. We've been talking about going to Mars since we went to the moon in 1969. Okay? And we haven't gone because it's so far away. If you and I go, it's going to be like a two-year trip there and back. Okay? But look how close to the sun it is on the scale of the whole solar system. Okay? Yeah. Okay. It's going to be two years to go to Mars. Yeah. I'd do it. Yeah. I'd do it. I'd do that one-way trip. It's, it's, yeah. it's a one-way trip. Yeah. Yeah. That's the moment. <laughs> okay. okay, now here's the tricky part. So we're going to fold the sun to Mars, and then before we unfold it, we're going to fold it again to Mars. And that should leave three folds on the inner part of the solar system. Yeah, just fold it on top of itself. Yep. <laughs> okay, and so those are the last three worlds we haven't marked on our map. Starting closest to the sun, they are... Mercury, and then Venus, and then this. Uh-oh. Ow. Oh. <laughs> I have four worlds. Uh, yeah. Wait, one, two, three, four. No, Mars is on the floor. Oh, right, yeah, Earth, Venus, and Mercury. Yeah, perfect. Great. Right. <laughs> okay. okay, that's the whole solar system on one piece of paper. Why are we going to Venus? You mean us as people? Yeah. 
So, so, so yeah. the surface of Venus is hot. Okay. So Venus has very dense clouds which trap heat on the planet. It's called the greenhouse effect. It's one of the reasons that we worry a lot about climate change on the Earth because we've seen it happen on another planet. And on the surface of Venus, it's 900 degrees Fahrenheit oh, right, right. all the time. So it'd be a good place to like, you know, send lawyers. <laughs> okay. So in the show, right, we're going to space jump from the Earth to the Moon. The very first thing. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yes. yes. Do we space jump to the Moon? Or Actually, we just fly to the Moon. Yeah. We can fly that fast. Yeah. yeah. Apparently. Okay. Yeah, a vertical launch tunnel. A vertical, <laughs> a vertical launch tunnel yeah. with things of this, like okay. magnetic, whatever. Yeah. Right. So slingshot. So we get we get about I'm going to call it 400 yeah. miles yeah. up uh -huh. uh, in like 10 seconds, and then uh, to get to it's the moon, the it's like you know 30. Okay. Seconds. Okay. Well, we have a table about travel time, so we'll talk about that here before we get all that. Okay. But on your map. Okay. On your map. How far away from the Earth should the moon be? Not very far. Not very far. Yeah. Okay, any guesses? <clears throat> like, you mean folding wise? Yeah, yeah, if you had to make another fold for the moon, where would you put it? Halfway between Earth and Mars? Halfway between Earth and Mars? Sixteenth of an inch? It's closer than that. It's closer yeah, than that. Yeah, it's yeah. like right on yeah. the ground. Right right right. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's about the width of a pencil line away Whoa. from the Earth on this yeah, map. I mean, Extremely no, close. Okay, so you can put the moon on there too, but it's pretty much on Earth's line yeah, I'll show you as far as we're concerned. Okay? Okay, so we're going to start at Earth, and then we're going to jump to the Sun, and then we jump to Mars, and we fly through the asteroids, and which asteroid do we stop at? Vesta. Okay, and then we fly to Jupiter, and Jupiter has a moon called Io. Or, uh, sorry, I think they're pronouncing it Iowa in the script. Okay, yeah. okay, sorry. So there's, there's international debate about what. Oh, I know. I'm sure we're going to hear that. <laughs> so I, I say EO by default, so, but it's Io in your script. I'll try and remember that. Okay, and then we'll jump to Saturn um, and Saturn's moon, which is Titan. Okay? Okay? But all the rest of this, all the rest of that paper, we're not going to in this trip. That's for next time. Where are these moons? Okay? Where are which moons? Titan and EO. So they, they also are around their planets, and they are not any farther from those planets, really, than Earth's moon is from the Earth. Right? So they're kind of a pencil line width away from each of these planets. Okay. Is there any sort of good definition for what uh, constitutes a moon of an outer planet versus a rock that's in orbit around it? <laughs> Uh, is no. there a size limit? I, I, no. I think if you're a planet and you're orbiting the planet, you're a moon. Okay. okay. So even now, if you're the size of a baseball. Yeah. We haven't had to face up against that fact yet because, in principle, every particle in Saturn's rings is the moon of Saturn. Okay. Right? But we haven't named all of them, right? I so, hope not. So yeah. all the big ones that we can see in photographs have names no matter how big they are. <laughs> so, and when we talk about Saturn's rings, at least verbally, we call oh, them little moons, moons of Saturn. Yeah. Okay. Right? I mean, sure yeah. but we haven't taken a picture of any single one of them yet. So, um, so, so there's, there's no. I we're still arguing about desk. what we call a planet, right? <laughs> wait, wait. Ah, okay, I am actually confused. What? Okay. So there's no pictures of the rings, you said? There's no pictures of the particles that make up the rings. Oh, oh okay. Right? That makes sense. Saturn's rings are so little we, snowballs, ice balls. Right. Yeah. So, we yeah. Have, so we have pictures of the rings, like as mm -hmm. we haven't zoomed in close enough to right. get to like the inner surface. Exactly. Right. Just for example. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's like if, if you and I were, um, have you ever done sand painting? Mm -hmm. Right. So you, 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 you put glue on a page and you drop the sand down and it, it makes a design, right? From far away, the sand looks like a smooth surface. But mm -hmm. when you look up close, you can see all the little individual parts. Mm -hmm. It's exactly what Saturn's rings are. Okay. It's far away. We just see this flat surface. It looks like rings. But if we could get up close, it would look like small individual little particles. Cool. Okay. And and yeah. This is a sort of a script question. What is a what is a world? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So world. Yeah, what does that mean? Or, so world, world is a very, right, so one, one of the things that we struggle with a lot in science is that we use language very precisely as astronomers. But, but when we talk to the public, right, we use words that mean something to us, but to the public it means something completely different. Okay? And, and, and words are more malleable, they're more flexible in kind of normal everyday conversation. And so while we use a word like world in the script or when we're talking to people, right, it generically means a whole bunch of different things. There's no precise definition of what an astronomy means when they say world. But we argue a lot about what we mean when we say the word planet, right? And this is the whole deal with Pluto right now, is Pluto a planet? Because scientists have in their head this very precise definition of what we mean when we say the word planet. But things like world, we don't. So for all intents and purposes in the show, when you say world, what we mean is anything that's orbiting the sun, or anything that's orbiting another planet. If you can land on it and walk around, we're going to call it a world. That's really the, the long yeah, and short of it. So it's a little different between like a power set design and an asteroid. Then. Right. That's a great question, right? So, so the word world is not precisely defined. And from the perspective of scientists, there's no difference. Okay? Now, when we talk about asteroids, right, this is why we argue about what's a planet. Right? So we have this, you're a planet, you're a dwarf planet things that are smaller than what's a planet. Um, and there's some other technical definitions that go with that. One of the things we haven't decided yet is what's the difference between a dwarf planet and an asteroid, <laughs> right? Because dwarf planets like Vesta and Ceres are round, ball-shaped, but there are asteroids that very definitely are not. They're more potato-shaped, right? They're irregular. And, and, and where that boundary is, we, we don't have a good definition. But, but generically, from, from your perspective, if you can land around and walk on it, you should feel absolutely comfortable calling it a war. We will back you up. It's almost like location, like just like, means like just a uh, movie set. Yeah, like that, <laughs> right? like that set is a world. That's yeah, right. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. So. There is a similar uh, sort of uh, situation where in the uh, promo that plays in the welcome gallery, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, the woman who's uh, in the promo uh, uses the phrase deep space. Ah, and people, right. people say, what's deep space? Yeah. And it, I mean, as far as I know, anything that's not Earth orbit <laughs> would it's qualify. deep space, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah so. but, but we don't consider Vesta a dwarf planet. Um, Ceres is. Ceres is a dwarf planet. I don't think Vesta is. And I think it's because it's not quite as round as it could be. Ceres is much rounder than Vesta is, but but I don't know exactly where it falls in the classification. So. And then, sorry, did I interrupt? No, you're okay. 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 So so this is this is this is something to just always keep in the back of your mind, right? The solar system is huge, which is why we're space jumping around it, right? <laughs> and we're not even space jumping that far, which is the part Wait. that kind of blows my mind, right? <laughs> Sun, not anymore actually. But it has a name. Do you guys know what its name is? Voyager? It was prominent in a Star Trek movie. Voyager? That's true. It's Voyager. Okay? So this is, there's two of them, um, but I want to talk about Voyager 1. Okay? Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 were the very first spacecraft we ever sent uh, past Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune to the outer solar system. And so lots of the pictures that you see of the moons that you guys are going to visit, of Jupiter and Saturn, uh, came from Voyager. Now, we have much better imagery uh, today of uh, Saturn from a mission called Cassini. So Cassini went to Saturn and stayed at Saturn. Voyager just flew right by. You know, it's the kind of, I'm driving across Nebraska. I'm not going to stop at every 25-foot-tall concrete cow. I'm just going to take a picture as I snap by. That's, that's what Voyager did as it was cruising through the solar system, okay? So, so 
now Voyager kind of went through, it saw all the planets, and now it's on the way out of the solar system. And today, it is the most distant object from the Earth that humans have ever built. Okay? Now, I've used a term here, AU. Does anyone know what that means? Units, yep. Yeah. The first one's the first one's astronomical. Okay, so so this is a technical term that astronomers use. Astronomical unit is the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Okay. Now on your maps, oh, how many light minutes is an astronomical unit? Eight. Okay, takes takes like eight minutes on your map to go from the Sun to the Earth. That's one astronomical unit. Pluto is roughly 40 astronomical units. So those sheets of paper you guys have are about 40 astronomical units long. About 40 times the Earth-Sun distance to get to Pluto. Okay? And this is 127. So if you wanted to put Voyager on one of your strips, you'd have to have a strip of paper, three copies of your strip of paper, to put Voyager where it is right now. So it's past Pluto. Past Pluto. Okay? Okay, it's the farthest object right. from the Earth that we've ever built. Yeah, yeah go. Okay, I we'll take a break. Crap. Speaking of astronomical <laughs> 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 I really have to go now. <laughs> 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 you take a quick break? Yeah, yeah everyone every should take a break. Yeah. You know, my friends who, who teach chemistry, man, they got it bad because no one loves chemistry, right? <laughs> Everyone I loves this stuff. <laughs> did you? Yeah. Okay, so a few weird people love chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got yeah, to blow yeah. stuff up. Yeah, people who like to blow stuff up, they love chemistry, right? <laughs> yeah. so, but astronomy, you know, it just kind of blows people's minds. I mean, they, they like that feeling, right? Yeah. So it's, it's yeah. a captive audience. I know the less I draw parallels between inner space of your brain and, uh -huh. and the universe. Like, I don't want to lose that, though. Like, I don't want to get rid of that. Because yeah. I like, it just even the, no, like, the, right. yeah, yeah. the images that have been produced from both of them are so similar that it's yeah. just like. <laughs> it's, it's very, uh, yeah, it's, it's hard to not. To, to not make connections or like yeah, not that's make right. a parallel.
And so we only get lots of aurora. There's always a little bit of auroras, but we only get lots of aurora when the sun's really, really active. Okay? And so that, that goes on this kind of 12-year cycle. And so right now, we're at the peak of that cycle. We're very near that peak. And if you're, if you're watching the right websites and, and whatnot, you will get uh, alerts that say the sun just threw off a coronal mass ejection. There's going to be a good chance of seeing auroras tonight. And if you're in, uh, you can get to the dark enough spots, you can see them. Yeah. And so, you know, in Montana, when I was living in Montana, we saw them all the time, right? You just go outside. We, we set up a calling tree. So we had these, we, we, we because everyone wanted to see it, right? Yeah. So we, we, we set it up, and everyone who wanted to see it, um, we, we put their name down, and we had two choices. You want to be called so you can see them no matter what time they appear, or you want to be called so you can see them only before midnight. Right. right. <laughs> and so then we just set up a circle so that if you saw them, you called the person, and then you went out to look while they called the next person, and then they went out to look, and so yeah. we just did this big calling tree. So uh -huh. we called it the calling circle. And so we saw them all the time because we had this network of people. And if I was out and I saw them, I called people and everyone got to see them. What time of year is the um, Well, so so in Chicago, you can't, so in right, in, in Montana. So any time it's dark. And so it just, it really depends on the sun. So, you know, during the, during the summer, right, it, you can see them if the sun's active. But, of course, it gets darker later in the day. So, it, you know, if you can't see them. But in the winter, you know, you can see them at 6 o'clock. But you know it's ten below, so, <laughs> so so it's good to see them any time of year. You just have to be away from the city lights, so. okay. and the sun has to be active. So. What, so we're talking about the aurora, the aurora borealis. You can see them from Chicago. Not with Chicago's light pollution, but you, you there there will be occasions when they are visible at Chicago's latitude, where Chicago is up here. But you have to go out, you know, past Rockford or somewhere where it's dark. So. Wow, but what do you? You, you have to get the alerts emailed to you. This is why I saw the alert. Alert. Got Yeah, so so the sun's very active right now. And when the sun's active is when you have chances to see lots of aurora. Very active. What does that mean? So the sun goes through the cycle where there are lots of explosions and prominences and sunspots and whatnot. And it, every 12 years it goes through the cycle. So it's active and then it's quiet and then it's active. And when it's active, it's throwing off material, solar prominences, so it's coronal mass ejection. And when those things come towards the Earth, we get a burst of activity that shows up as the aurora borealis. Can we mark it? Or is there like a pattern that it follows every mm -hmm. 12 years, you said? Well, yeah, so, 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 so we absolutely know the sun goes through that cycle. Yeah. And, and the way we can monitor it, and you guys too, um, is if you uh, use a special telescope, don't do this on your own, right? But, <laughs> but uh, if you count the number of sunspots, the number of sunspots goes up when the sun is active, and it goes down when the sun's quiet. So right now, um, we've been observing out at the Dome every sunny, sunny day. And if you go out to the Dome, they're usually out there from 11.30 to 1.30. They have a special solar telescope, and you can look. And right now, there's you know, 25 sunspots, so the sun's very active. Yeah. So what's the highest it can be? What's the highest dark zone in sunspots? In sunspots? Um, I've, I've seen a lot of sunspots. Um, I haven't been watching very much this cycle, but uh, we were out at Buckingham Fountain uh, last week. We saw about 25, and that was a, that was a good number for this cycle. So. But that's weird because some spots are cooler areas of mm -hmm. the sun. Yep. But that's when it's more active than a cooler area. Yeah, yeah. So it's cool because it's cool because when the sun's active, it generates a lot of magnetic field. So you know, like magnets. You know, mm -hmm. they, the 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 magnetic part of that is called the magnetic field. It comes up from the center of the sun, and those places on the surface where it comes up from, it makes it cool. Oh. That's why this is like sort of pushing the rest of the way. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah. So you see these pictures of solar prominences and stuff. Yeah. Um, those are all all the material on the sun is controlled by the magnetic field underneath it. So when we talk about the sun, I'll show you guys some cool movies about it. Yeah. So. Okay. Okay. So so this is Voyager. So it's the most. So you need three of your 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 pieces of paper in order to put Voyager down. <laughs> okay. Because it's 127 times the Earth-Sun distance, or three times the Pluto distance. Okay, now we'll use this fact in a minute, but it's also currently the fastest human object we've ever built. Whoa. It's traveling at 16 kilometers per second. Okay, so that's basically clear across the city of Chicago in one second. Right. So, so it's cool if you go to the NASA website for Voyager, it's got a current Voyager distance, and it's just sitting there counting up <laughs> you know, as fast as it can possibly go. <laughs> it's awesome. So, 
Okay, so 16, so that's about 35,800 miles per hour. Are we still getting, I maybe you mentioned Yes. It, we're still, yes. Awesome. We're still talking to it. What's the plan? So it is looking for the edge of the solar system. Okay, and by edge of the solar system, so the sun is, you know, throwing out material like we were just saying. It also has this very steady wind of particles we call the solar wind. It's just because everything on the sun's hot, it's just pushing all that energy out. You and I feel it as heat when we're out picnicking, but all that energy is just streaming out through the solar system. But eventually, it kind of dies off, and all the pressure from all the other stars in the galaxy presses in on it. And Voyager's looking for that edge. And we think we just passed it, just this past year, uh, but we're still talking to it and trying to measure exactly what's going on as we pass through that, that zone. And since what year again has it been active? 1977. So it's taken us 30 years to get to 127 times the Earth's sun distance. So can it be pulled back in, or is it nope. just going to reach the edge and it's, then go back? It's going gonna, it's gonna to keep going. In about 40,000 years, it will pass close to another star. <laughs> Did you say 40,000 years? 40,000 years. Yeah. Going that fast? Yeah. Great. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. So so actually, let's talk. Okay. So that's I can see my slides now. That's next. Okay. So suppose we wanted to, on your map, put the closest star. Sun. But not the sun. You're absolutely right. There's <laughs> so always some student who remembers that. Okay. <laughs> the closest star besides the sun, where would it be on our piece of paper? 40, whatever you just said. Like, oh, well, 40,000 years, but how big a piece of paper are we going to use to do it? Where would we have to put it? 20 of these. 20? 120? I'm bad. I just said guessing. 60. 60 of these. Okay, you guys ready? You have to have a piece of paper that's 52.3 miles long. <laughs> so the closest star besides the sun would be in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Okay. On this, so we just stretch our calculator tape up late short drive, just keep going up the coast. So 20 Kenosha. wouldn't do it. 20 wouldn't do it. <laughs> okay. So the nearest star is enormously far away on this scale. Okay, so look at look at where you guys are. You're right here. Think about how big you are on that scale. Huh. <laughs> I don't mind that. Okay. Oh, I and love that. You have to go all the way up here to get to the closest star. So what is the closest star on Earth? You guys know besides the sun? Nothing. Nothing. So this is it. Alpha, that's the Greek letter Alpha. Alpha Centauri. Alpha Centauri. Oh. Okay. It takes light four and a quarter years to get there. And something we discovered, I think, just two years ago is there's planets around. Which is awesomely cool. We could go. Oh. There would be a place to land. There would be worlds to land on if we could go. Do we know what's do we know what's on those planets? Nope. We just know they're there at this point. We need bigger telescopes, more time to stare at them. We need to invent space express. Yeah. We need yeah, we need space jump express. That's right. Yeah. I need I need to talk to the spouse and let me bigger bigger telescope. So okay? Now that's to the nearest star. Okay. Now, where do we live in the universe? On Earth, in the Milky Way galaxy. So if I wanted to go from us to the center of the Milky Way galaxy, where would I have to put it on this map? How long would my piece of paper have to be? I'm like right behind the sun. No, Alpha Centauri's in Wisconsin, right? Okay. So I want to go to the center of the galaxy. And Alpha Centauri is in the Milky Way. Alpha Centauri. Yeah. it's the sun. It's oh. Well, yes. Yeah, right? Okay. Um, Every star you can see in the sky is in the Milky Way. Okay. Kentucky? Yeah. Okay, Florida, Kentucky's Florida. a good guess. Okay, <laughs> Florida. <laughs> Brazil. <laughs> I'm so unclear. So this is the edge of this. So here's the sun at this okay. time right here. Okay. Okay. And all the way here is the next closest star to the sun. Okay. If I keep going, how far do I have to go before I get to the center of the galaxy we live in? Oh, Canada. Canada? Yeah, I'm actually That's so big. Right Where in Canada? To, um, um, Alaska. Brazil. Okay. Is it oh, Alaska? Okay. Alaska? Oh, Alaska. I'll just say China. China? Oh, did you say the United States? Okay. <laughs> the center of the Milky Way is 24,000 light years away. Okay. So if we wanted to have a piece of paper that we marked it on, oh that piece of paper would have to go to the moon at 50,000 miles farther <laughs> before we could mark <laughs> where 
the center of the Milky Way galaxy. Right. So like Brazil. <laughs> so like way farther than Brazil. <laughs> what? So about Brazil. So what is at the center of the Milky Way galaxy? A black hole four million times bigger than the sun. Four million. Four times million. Million. Bigger than the sun. Four yeah. billion. Four million suns. Four million suns squished together. <laughs> Sucking in. It's doing some crazy stuff. If we can talk about that. Yeah. Right now, it's sucking up a cloud called G2. But. And I'm sorry, right. for, 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 for a million, million solar masses. Yes, okay. that's what we say. That's what you'll hear us say. Four no. million solar masses. Four million times the mass. The other week, we were talking about how if you were at the edge of a particular black hole, that it would be like a second there would be thousands of years, right? Yeah, yeah. So time gets all screwed up. Near is the that black every hole. black hole has that ordeal, or each one has yes. its each different <laughs> characteristic? No, no, they all it, do it. Is there a name for that black hole? It's called uh, uh, Sagittarius A star. So Sagittarius is the constellation that it's in. Oh, I am a Sagittarius. Oh, you got a big black hole. And we usually yeah. write it this way. We usually write it this way. A star. Okay, and if, we, if we're abbreviating it, you'll see us write this. SGR is the abbreviation for Sagittarius. So that, we'll talk about that black hole eventually, but that's what's at the center of the galaxy. Okay? You guys just get to make shit up all day. I said, you guys just get to make shit up all day. Yeah, you guys have no idea if I'm telling you right or not, right? Okay, this is the Andromeda galaxy. Okay, it's, called, it's also called M31. It is the closest galaxy to the Milky Way that is more or less built the same way the Milky Way is. Okay, so we call this a spiral galaxy because it has this nice spiral shape. Okay, it has big spiral arms, a bright yellow core. There's a black hole in the center of Andromeda as well. Isn't that a barred, barred spiral? Or? The Milky Way is barred. Um, Andromeda is not. Oh, or it, its bar is very weak compared to the Milky Way. What, what is barred? Yeah, you so so up when you it. look yeah. at spiral <laughs> galaxies, when you look at the center, the center will either be really, really round or it will look elongated. Mm -hmm and then the spiral arms cut off the ends of that. And if it's elongated, we say that it's barred. That, that, that structure is called a bar. What's the circular one? Uh, it's, it's, just, it's called unbarred, it's just called a spiral. Yeah. Okay, this is the most distant object you can see with your naked eye. Okay, so you can't see it from Chicago with your naked eye. But if you and I head out you know, into the wild lands out past Kenosha in the dark, okay, you can see this with your naked eye. Okay, it looks like a little fuzzy patch up in the sky. Okay, what? It's two and a half million light years away. So the light, if you guys, we went out tonight and we looked at it, the light that we see has taken two and a half million years to travel to the Earth. Mm -hmm. no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and if we put this on our map, no, no. our piece of paper would have to go past the orbit of Mars. Use up all the trees on there. It would use up all the trees on there. <laughs> no more trees because those folks at the end there had to make a map. They had the Andromeda galaxy on it. Okay? okay. So the universe is huge. Okay? And we talk about all this stuff as if it's in our backyard. Okay? Mostly because we can take pictures of it like this, right? This is easy. If you and I get my big telescope, and we look at the Andromeda galaxy, I mean, this is what it looks like. You can see these spiral arms, you can see all this dust and everything. You can see that in, a, in your telescope? Yeah, this is what it looks like through a telescope the size of my telescope. Like, a, like uh, Joe. What? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And Hubble takes pictures like this every single day, right? And so we get kind of immune to this idea that this stuff is really, really far away. And it seems so close. <laughs> and it <laughs> seems so close, right? Okay, but your map and Trying to imagine where all these things go on your map, really, they're just attempts to try and make how mind-bogglingly large it is fit inside our brains. Yeah, and it still doesn't. Like, and it still doesn't, like, right? I'll feel it for a second, and it's yeah. like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's why my brain is going like yeah. this right now. I know, I know. <laughs> it's just going to start leaking out. <laughs> <laughs> the picture of the of the moon stretching. The that's stretching. probably what my brain yes. is like. Yeah. I always, yeah, like in my head, pictures this the whole, the. Tides of, yeah. the the tides of my ignorance are <laughs> Yeah, but that's why it's fun, right? Yeah, like, oh, oh, totally. I can learn all this stuff. Okay, so let's talk about going there. Okay.
okay, I know we're using the space jump technology, but I wanted you guys to have in your head some understanding of what it would really take to get to these places. Okay, what Fred Hoyle said at the beginning, space is only an hour away, that's why you drive straight up. Okay, well, I'm gonna have a fast car. And uh, my students all know that my favorite car in the world is the Yugo. <laughs> because, because they're awesome. <laughs> you guys ever see a movie called Drowning Mona? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So that oh movie is, is, the setting for that movie is purportedly the town where they build Yugos. Right. So every car in that movie is, is a, a Yugo. Yugo. Yes. Oh my <laughs> so, so, so I use Yugos for everything that we talk okay? <laughs> So suppose I had an imaginary Yugo that could go 60 miles an hour. I'm pretty sure they can. Suppose they did. Okay. Let's talk <laughs> about sure how long it would take to go places. Okay, so we're not going to go every place, but here's a list of places we could go. Earth orbit, we could go to the moon, we could go to Mars, Pluto. Okay, so this is all on your map. Okay. The center of the Milky Way and Andromeda, which we just talked about. Okay, and let's imagine all of these different ways we could go there. So we could go in a car. Okay, that's pretty much the fastest any of us go any given day. But, you know, maybe you drive 80 on the Dan Ryan. You know, that's okay. 80, 60, it's going to be roughly the same. A jetliner. Okay. Or if we could do it in Voyager, which is the fastest object humans have ever built. Okay? And then I have the distances written there, so you guys know how we're going. Okay? So Earth orbit is just 350 kilometers above our head. Okay? So that's a little bit higher than the space station is, but, but that's roughly right. Okay? If I went in my car, it'd take about three and a half hours. If I went in a jet, it'd only take 22 minutes. But if I could go in Voyager, it'd take 22 seconds, traveling at 16 kilometers. Yeah. So this is roughly the speed you're going to do it in the show, right? You're going to go from launch to orbit in about 20 about seconds. 20 percent, yeah. So that you're going about as fast as Voyager's going. Now, Voyager is, what, is, it, is, it, is, it, is it been slingshotting itself off the planet's yeah. gravitational force? Yeah. And then again and again? Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune to get going as fast as it's going now. Wow. But they didn't know it was going to go that fast. Well, fast. we had, we had yeah. estimated yeah, that it would, right? But we couldn't build a rocket that would make it. We had to use the science. Um, have they been, is there some small propulsion uh, devices on it that would like allow it to get into that uh, gravitational pull and get out? And get so it, it has little thrusters that it controls yeah. its orientation with, but none of that's, it's not encountering any more planets. So now it's just keeping its antenna pointed at Earth. Right. That's all it's Since doing. it's been going for so long, mm -hmm. um, does it have like a rechargeable plug? It has a little now. nuclear power plant. Okay, so so if you look at that picture of Voyager, there's this kind of one arm sticking off to one side that has this long cylinder on it. That's a nuclear power plant that's providing all the electricity that it's using to talk to us. But the thrusters and all of that are expendable. It's like gas in a, in, a, in your car. So if they use it, it's gone. And so they're very conservative in how and when they use it. I don't even know how much they have left, actually. I'd have to go look that up. But, but it's, a cons it's what we call a consumable in the space station. And Mark was saying like that has to be calculated because it, the talking to it, that takes an amount of time to be like, no, get into the orbit. 15 minutes from now, get into the orbit. It has to be calculated. Yeah. So, so, so it's out past Pluto. Pluto's <laughs> five hours away at the speed of light, and it's three times farther. So Voyager is about 15 hours away traveling at the speed of light. And then to answer us is another 15. 30 hour round trip just to talk to Voyager. Wow. Wow. Is that awesome? That's really awesome. That's just awesome. That's just awesome. Yeah. That I get. For some reason, that makes sense. Why would that be? Because cell phones? Because, because, because in phone. your life, you experience these at a 30 hour time scale. Yeah. Yeah. 30 hours from now, it's going to be Friday night. You're going to be out at the pub drinking with friends, right? You can comprehend that. Yeah. Two and a half million years from now, I mean, you're going to be ahead in a jar somewhere. Right. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm lucky. <laughs> <laughs> make, make sure it something cool. <laughs> so, right, I mean, but the, that, that's why, right? We can wrap our brains around things. That, and that's why talking about this is, is so hard, because I can explain all of this in terms of everyday experiences, driving in a car, flying in a jet. But as you see, these numbers are going to get crazy in a minute. We don't have any concept of what those numbers mean, right? Okay. Okay? Okay, so. The moon is 375,000 kilometers away. How long did it take the astronauts to fly to the moon? You guys know? Don't know. About Weeks. four days. About four days. Okay. So, in your car, it would take you 5.4 months to drive to the moon. Okay, so clearly the astronauts were going quite a bit faster. 16 days if you flew in a jumbo jet. Okay, 
Okay, so the astronauts were going even faster in the jumbo jet. 6.5 hours in Voyager. Okay, so the astronauts were going somewhere in between. Okay, but we're going to go there in 20 seconds, 30 seconds in the show. Okay, so to get from the Earth to the moon in the show, you're going to have to travel faster than Voyager. Okay, so that's, that's where the science fiction in the show is going to start, right? At that moment where you're, you're going to have to travel faster than we've ever had to travel before to get to the moon. Oh my God, it has to get to the moon. Can, can we do an envelope calculation about, well, I mean, the, the in light time, how far is the moon? So oh, yeah, we, you know, well, I know that uh, number. Yeah. It's about a, a second. A little bit less than a second. So, uh, mm -hmm. uh, so if we take, let's say, ten seconds to get to the moon, then we're going about uh, uh, thirty uh, thousand two meters per second. So that's thirty thirty kilometers yeah. per second. Yeah. Is that right? Did I just do that right in my head? Yeah, yeah. I, got, I was doing it in miles. Oh, you were doing it in miles. Oh, sorry, I was doing it in metrics. Because I know the speed of light in metric. <laughs> yeah. Is so, yeah. is there any way to counteract the effects of a force that great traveling that fast? Sorry, I didn't understand that. Say that one more time. We, like, we talk about, oh, don't worry about seatbelts because you know, we, have, we have advanced safety features mm -hmm. and uh, artificial gravity. Is there any, I mean, I know it's a little sci-fi, but when we talk about or even conceptualize traveling at such great speeds and having humans survive that, what would it take to counteract that force? So, if anything, so so even, even so the way it's presented in the show is a lot of sci-fi, right? right? Artificial gravity, and everything. Yes, yes, yes. But but the answer to that question is actually has some really deep physics in it, right? Which has to do with our understanding of what gravity is all about, right? So so the point is is that if you and I go out and get my Yugo and I floor it, right? Go from zero to sixty in three seconds, right? <laughs> You get what happens to you. You get very beginning, pushed back push in your back, seat. Right? But then we equalize, right? Right, and then you equalize. And so that that feeling that you feel is can be interpreted exactly the way we see gravity affect objects. Right? You're being pulled down onto your seat right now. Your seat's pushing up on your rear end because gravity's pulling you down exactly the same way you get pushed back in the seat in your car. But you and I are so used to that we don't even think about it, right? Yeah. Gravity's pulling me down into my seat the same way I get pushed back in my chair, but I'm so used to it, I just filter it out. I don't even think about it. And the way physicists think about that is if I want to control the forces on your body, I have to counteract those forces exactly the same way I might counteract gravity. So if I can control gravity, I can control the forces on your body. That's really the point. Right. Hey, yeah, because... Because, we because the rocket up. wants to push you back in your seat, but I can use anti-gravity to push you out of your seat. Okay. Right? That's right. that's the way it goes. Is there such a thing as anti-gravity? There are mathematical models for how this would work, but we don't know how to make it work. Because the material, I can tell you exactly what the properties of the material have to be to create anti-gravity. And we've never seen that material in the known universe. But in other fields, maybe. That's right. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist, right? The point is we've never seen any, at least not here on Earth. So physicists have a name for this stuff. We call it exotic matter. How do they say Oh my god, I thought they were stupid. But it is weird stuff, right? I mean, I can tell you these are its properties and then go go around and compute all the things that would happen if I had, you know, a... a Nalgene bottle full of the stuff. And I mean, you can do crazy stuff with it. You can open up wormholes, you can make warp drives, you know, I can have anti gravity. If I had exotic matter, there would be awesome stuff we could do. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. But the point is, is, is to overcome forces, that, that whole phrase that you say in there with the anti gravity and everything, mm -hmm. that's all connected. And that's how we control the forces. Okay. In reality. In reality. Well, it quotes around reality, but theoretical physics wise, that's how you do it. <laughs> okay. So when you when you talk to your mom on the phone tonight, you'd be like, Oh yeah, I talked about theoretical physics to your mom. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay? Okay, so Mars.
Okay, so now the numbers start getting a little crazy, right? So Mars is 90 million kilometers away. If we were driving in our car, it would take 106 years to get there. So just a human lifetime. What did you do for your life? I drove to Mars in my car. Oh, my <laughs> grandma would almost be there. Oh, wow. She'd be almost Two years, be there, right? my grandma would be there. Oh. So do you, guys, do you guys want a cool factoid to carry around in your head? So today, if you add up all the time for all the humans that have spent in space, and this is mm -hmm. every astronaut, it's about this amount of time. Oh, wow. So if I add up all the time, all the astronauts have spent, it's about 110 years. That's all the time we're spent in space. One human lifetime. Wow. Everyone together. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. <laughs> Seems so. very new. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> and the space age has been going on since then for 40 years. Wow. So, okay. Uh, if you were in a jet, it'd take you 10 years to fly to Mars. And Voyager, you could get there in 55 days. In reality, um, we send spacecraft to Mars every two years. It takes six to nine months to get to Mars. So to fly to Mars in reality is years. Yeah, we send spacecraft to Mars every. So every two years, there's a good opportunity to send an easy opportunity to send closer. a spacecraft to Mars. It has to do with the, not exactly at that moment. It's closer. It has to do with where Mars is going to be nine months after we launch the spacecraft. Of course, yeah. Okay, but it has to do with how the Earth and Mars are going around in their orbits. Okay, so you know if you go up on the floor, you've seen the model of the Mars rover. Okay, so yes. right, we send a mission like that every couple of years. So, so it takes about eight, nine months to get to Mars. Okay, Pluto. Okay, Pluto. We said five and a half hours at the speed of light. Okay, driving in our car takes sixty-nine hundred years to drive in our car. It would take six hundred and ninety years traveling in a jumbo jet. Okay, so this is what uh, seven hundred years ago. So, so this is like what. Uh, 1300s. So if you'd gotten in a 747 in the 1300s and headed off to Pluto, you'd just now be getting that stuff. Okay? Voyager, 11.8 years. Okay? Now, there is a spacecraft on the way to Pluto right now. It's the very first spacecraft we've ever sent. It's called New Horizons. It was launched in 2006. It will get there next summer. So it's been flying for just about this Really, really, really far away. Sarah the Milky Way, we said, was 26,000 years traveling at the speed of light, which would take your car 291 billion years, right? This is older than the age of the solar system, driving in your car. <laughs> Flying in a jet 29 billion years, also older than the age of the solar system. <laughs> 487 billion years traveling at Voyager. So if the dinosaurs had launched a Voyager, it would just now be getting to the center of the galaxy. Okay? I bet they did. Yeah, I'm I sure they did, see right? The <laughs> <laughs> There's totally a Stegosaurus Pro approaching the Milky Way black hole right now. So. Okay, and the numbers get even crazier for Andromeda, right? It's two and a half million light years. It'll take almost 30 trillion years this number by any measure. Okay. 46 billion years traveling in Voyager. Okay? universe is huge, <laughs> which is why you need the space jump technology. <laughs> so. Okay? So we've been going about an hour and a half. I think we're probably good for the day. So unless you guys want to ask some more questions or talk about some more stuff. We I have a quick question. Yes, please. Who, sends the ro who s usually sends a rover, like the Mars rover? So, so, so there have been many rovers in space exploration history. The very first ones were sent by the Russians to the moon. Okay, they were called Lunakhod. Lunakhod. <laughs> and so they're they're dead, but, but they're on the they're on the moon. Um, we bounce lasers off of them now. Okay, the Chinese just sent a rover to the moon two or three months ago, and it's now dead. They had a, an electronics failure, but it roved around on the moon for a little while, which was cool. Uh, but to Mars, only the United States has sent rovers to Mars. And so we've sent four rovers at this point. So the very first one was called Sojourner. It was about the size of a microwave oven. And it was, it kind of drove, I think, what, 18 meters total or something like that. Okay. And then we sent uh, the Mars Exploration Rovers, which are Spirit and Opportunity. That's the model we have upstairs. 
Um, Spirit is dead. Um, she got stuck <laughs> in uh, she got stuck in uh, uh, sand dunes, and uh, they couldn't get it free. And it's bad news to die now. But opportunity is still roving. Um, and then we sent curiosity uh, uh, last last year. Yeah, last year. So curiosity is dead. Um, I just saw the European Space Agency is getting ready to send a rover, and their rover has some crazy name which I can't remember. It's like the European Mars Super Rover or something. I can't remember what it's called. Uh, but, but they're <laughs> that's right. So so they're gonna they're gonna send a rover. I think in four years or something. I, I have to look up the dates. But I just saw that go by my Twitter stream a couple days ago. How is it transformed the the design of the rover? So the Through rovers these. have gotten bigger over time. Okay, and so they, they get bigger for a couple of reasons. Um, they are getting more capable, and uh, they are going with kind of new science missions to do. So, so the first rover, Sojourner, was really the goal was just to prove we could rove around. And so it was very small. Um, it had a little instrument on it called uh, the Alpha Proton X-ray Spectrometer. Right, it was basically a. a <laughs> no, <laughs> it was this little. It was kind of like an X-ray probe. You would put it up against a rock, and it would shoot X-rays into the rock, and it would look at what bounced back, and it, they could tell what the rock was made. What? Okay. That's awesome. Isn't that cool? So, so it and but it didn't carry a radio and you know all that stuff that it needed, or cameras or any of that. And so they had a lander with it that's now called the Sagan Memorial Station. Okay. So Sagan, yeah, Carl Sagan. Say yeah. Say yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so that whole mission was called Mars Pathfinder, and so um, it was the first mission we ever landed on Mars with airbags. You guys have probably seen mo uh, movies of that. Uh -huh. So there was it's this kind of gigantic pyramid of airbags, and we just dropped it, and it bounced on the surface, and, and then the airbags collapsed, and then pulled us down. But but because it had that lander with it, the rover had to be really small because we had to keep the rover on the lander, and it had to be you know, tied down, and then set. With there, the MERS, so there's no cameras now. There's no cameras on the rover. There were cameras on the base station. Okay. Okay. And so you you'll see pictures of the rover run, running around on Mars, but they were all taken by the base station. Okay. The MERS, which are the model we have upstairs, they had their own cameras. They had a small drill, so not only would they look at the, they could drill into the rocks and and then do their science, um, and then they had. Uh, uh, roving capability that allowed them to turn and go over bigger obstacles. And they're about the size of, well, the one upstairs is life size, so it's about the size of this table. Yeah. Okay. Wow. They have solar panels, so they're completely um, driven by the sun. They can't, during the winter on Mars, they have to stop and tip themselves on a hillside so they get enough sunlight to stay alive. And then when summer comes on Mars again, they go roving. Um, but but that, that they have their solar panels. So when we built Curiosity, we did want to be limited by the solar panels. Curiosity has a nuclear power plant, and so it's a little bit bigger. We have a nuclear power plant. We have a lot more energy to deal with. Wow. It has a drill. It has cameras all over it. It has a laser that it shoots rocks with. Um, it can you know, blast holes into rocks. No. And, you know, yeah. Yeah. It, if it exploded, like, if, if it could, like, the nuclear power that it has, could it, like, blow up on it? No, no. So, so these these power plants are are so these 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 nuclear power plants that we use on spacecraft are called um, RTGs, radioisotopic thermal generators. So the way they generate electricity is not the way that we generate electricity in nuclear power plants on Earth. They just have a whole chunk of radioactive material which is too small to explode. Okay. But because it's radioactive, it's hot, and that heat can be captured and used to generate electricity. Awesome. Okay, but there's not enough there to make an explosion. Right? But in the nuclear power plant, there is. And the whole game in nuclear power plants on Earth is keeping all of that stuff far enough away from each other that if they touch, they don't explode. <laughs> right. Oh, right. so like the yeah. cool, yeah. cool. But the, the amount on these space boats is really small. Cool. My niece's husband worked okay. on building that. Oh, OK, cool. Uh, wow. Awesome. It's about this big. Yeah. It's wow. Yeah, and I think that was more my question. Not more. This is all my question. The, um, like who sends the rover? Like who? Like NASA or yeah. the, like Jim and Kathy sent? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, so so this is the, so so it's NASA, okay? okay? But here's an interesting exercise, okay? So you can look up on Wikipedia the cost of of, of building a Curiosity rover, okay? And if you then do something like take Bill Gates' fortune 
and divide it by the cost of the rover. Bill Gates could pepper Mars with 500 of these. That's awesome. Right? Well, it'd be awesome if he did. <laughs> right? I mean, we would know stuff about Mars that like, you wouldn't believe. <laughs> because, wow. because it's not that, I mean, it's expensive, but it's not that expensive. Yeah, some, some, uh, uh, right? A few billionaires. If, if I was, here. Right? We have billionaires in Chicago, mm -hmm. right? If I was a billionaire, I would totally be building my own rover to go to Mars. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because I'd be like, yeah, baby, I got my own rover. <laughs> I'm going to drive where I want to drive. Do you have any videos of, of the rover shooting rocks with lasers? Uh, so the so the, the laser's not visible on video, but if you if you can, I can have the, when we talk rock. about Mars, I'll show you guys the pictures. Okay. They have pictures of the rock after it's been shot with the laser. You can see the hole. Oh, cool. That's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> I want to play that game. Could you, could you just do it, like, if, if you had all the money in the world, and you were like, I built this rover, I built this rocket, uh, whatever you need to get up there. Could you just do it from your backyard? Well, so... The launch is the problem. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Google is yeah. oh. having a contest you gotta, you gotta right now. Here. Oh, my God. Okay. Yeah. Which one? It's, it's uh, back, to back to the moon for good. All right. So Google's having a contest, and to compete in the contest, you have uh, to yeah. get something to the moon, have it land or fly over the surface for, I think, 500 meters, 500 meters half a kilometer. Um, He's got a notebook full You have to, <laughs> oh my God, I, I was like, oh my God. You have <laughs> to take some together. high definition pictures or video and transmit them back to Earth. If, you do, if you're the first one to do all of that, $30 million. Wait, seriously? Oh, seriously. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wait, but, but, so, so just yesterday I tweeted a story about there's a group of kids at Penn State. There's well, so you know students who are doing this, right? At and Penn so, State? Yeah, Penn State, right? Bastards. So they're the only university team that's entered right now. So, but, but they, so, so the thing that cracked me up is they listed how much money they need to win this prize. It's $40 million. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh. I was going to say, like, you get but, but that's not the point. It's like, the prestige of the prize, right? Yeah. The whole point of these prizes, right? The, so these, this X Prize Foundation, oh, Pierre yeah. <laughs> it's just like when Lindbergh flew across the Atlantic, right? It, right? That was a contest. It, right? it was a contest, yeah. and it cost a lot. It took a lot of investment, but that wasn't the point. The prestige of being the person who flew across yeah. the Atlantic, and it paved the way for you know transatlantic flights. That's right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And Bert Rutan, he won the first X Prize for building the first commercial spacecraft to break the boundary of space, yeah. right? So it's called Spaceship One. That turned into a contract and a business with Richard Branson. It's called Virgin Galactic. Yeah. So now you and I can buy tickets. And go to the so that's yeah. happening now? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're flying next year, I think. Oh, my their gosh. First one. I remember when they just started selling tickets, and it seemed mm -hmm. like forever ago. Uh, yeah, but like, next yeah. year. They've, they've done their third, fourth test flight now. So. I just wanted the money. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Prestige, well, believe prestige. me, yeah. When it was announced, I spent well, probably a couple hours going like, "Okay, well, how could you do this for like fifty or a hundred thousand dollars <laughs> and really clean up on this?" Yeah. You know? How can I do this with my salary from the outside? <laughs> <laughs> so you you have to you just you have to actually do it. You can't come up with the. You place. have to actually do it. Well, but but this is the point, right? Is that if you have a plan that's going to work. Because if I go to Richard Branson and I say, Richard, come on, look <laughs> at this. Baby. This is awesome, right? I'm going to send these theater operators in a balloon, and when the balloon is the size, they're gonna get, I'm going to set up a rocket, and they're going to go to space. He'd be like, oh, sure, that's great. <laughs> Here's 10 mil. Let's see that happen. <laughs> and I'll be like, I need, I need 13 mil, because if I lose one theater operator, I have to pay yeah, for another. <laughs> 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 Just don't send any puppies up there, okay? Right. <laughs>
his point is that in the early part of the 20th century, right after the Wright brothers had invented airplanes and everything, the military was using them and everyone was all you know, gung-ho about this. But you didn't see a lot of commercial applications. There was no incentive for people to figure out how to make it work commercially. And you know, hearing that now, you and I are like, that's crazy. I can get on any Delta flight I want to fly to Rio de Janeiro, right? Mm -hmm. but, but, but in that era, before the commercial industry was in place, people didn't have a reason to do it. And so Pete's point is, what drove them to make the commercial airline industry? Well, there were all of these prizes, right? Like Lindbergh's prize was, was the classic example. And so he's like, what if we did the same thing for space? Because when we went to the moon, we were all like, yeah, we're going to have hotels in space, and you know, we'll be able to you know, go into space like, tour, like I go to Jamaica, right? And that hasn't happened. And so the whole XPRIZE Foundation notion is that if we make this incentive, maybe we can jumpstart this privatization that we've all dreamed about since we started the space age. Yeah. And, and, and it's kind of happening, right? The first XPRIZE was awarded, and now we have a commercial space flight opportunity appearing. You and I still can't afford it. Well, I can't afford it. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, two, yeah. 200K a ticket, right? Is that right? <laughs> 200K a ticket? I don't have that many spousal approval units. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, 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 it's, but you can see maybe it's really going to happen, right? So we'll see. By the time you and I are, you know, 80, maybe we'll be able to go to space the way we go to San Antonio. Build the tomorrow you want. <laughs> uh, I just want that money. It's all I'm thinking about. Like, Is that right? How do I make that happen? All that sweet, yeah. sweet cheddar. Yeah. That's <laughs> what I want. I got to make that work. I want to still uh, Yeah, well, the only, the only requirement is if you guys win those prizes, you have to give a million dollar grant to the Aspen. All right. Okay. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. That's fine. That's a number. Yeah. What is it, 30 billion? <laughs> a million. No, million. Uh, <laughs> still. Okay, so this is what we'll talk about. So, so we, we kind of break the solar system up into three groups of things, right? And um, this, is, this is the terrestrial worlds are all the rocky planets in the middle, the gas giants are the ones in the outer. These are the ones that you guys are going to talk about in the show, so we'll do those first. But then after, we're, and we probably should spend the whole day talking about Mars just because everyone wants to talk about Mars. But um, this is comets and asteroids and stuff like that. Um, and then I have a talk that I do for people that's completely about real spaceship travel, how to build real starships and you know, how to really go to the stars. And so it's, it's not space jump technology exactly, but you may be interested in that. Since you're you're down you see this? Yeah. 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 So anyway, so I, I have a starship talk that we can do at some point. Like warp drive and whole bit. Yeah, yeah, that whole bit. Wait, so. like you know how to yeah. build I, I, I have to confess to you guys, I have a published scientific paper about the warp drive with my name on it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I am the it's right person blog? to that. Huh? It's not on my blog, but I can send you a copy of it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. What? Wow. That's, That's so cool. Like you know how to build it. And is it using? Oh, yeah, we know how to build it. So yeah. really, you could send it up. To yeah, yeah. I, I just need some nuclear bombs. And, and we say, get out there and dollars. So if you guys do have some uranium, we can totally do it. We can totally <laughs> do it. <laughs> Oh yeah, we're gonna, talk about, like, the, we're gonna talk about the rocket technology that they're using. I was like, those are warheads. You're just you're finding blueprints from warheads and it's like, wow, that's that's crazy. Wait, how much does uranium cost? Cost? You mean like on cost? Amazon? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look it up. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Like this is used, but it's still it's still a good price. It's a good price. There's a different it's internet you want to go to to buy that stuff. Yeah, no. Someone's gonna flag you pretty hard. <laughs> Oh god! But that's uh, when you talk about the exotic matter. Is that in the in the warp drive? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. You need a little bit of exotic matter to make it work. A little bit, mm. just a little bit. <laughs> a little goes a long way. A little goes a very <laughs> long way. <laughs> <laughs> so. Is that was in the Death Star where they shoot out the Death Star? Is that <laughs> Wait, oh, I see the Star Wars. No, what you need to be watching is Cosmos. 
Perceive Sagittarius right. from Earth. It's behind the constellation Sagittarius. Okay. Oh, okay. The stars that we call Sagittarius are between us and the black hole. Um, Alpha Centauri. Where is that in the night sky? Where do we see that? So it's so Centaurus is a southern constellation. So from our latitude here in Chicago, you can't see it. Oh. But if you go far enough south, I think even just to Arizona kind of latitude, you can it'll pop up above the horizon. Yeah, yeah, they've so seen they Night Sky, sky Live, they've seen Cosmic, cosmic Wonder. wonder. Okay. Um, I, I, I saw Back to the Moon for good during uh, Alpha. Yeah, I haven't seen Back to the Moon yet. Is that the new one? I mean, it's, it's exciting. They, yeah. make, they dramatize it really well. Yeah, good. Well, Tim Allen's yeah. a wonderful man. I, the universe one? I haven't seen that one. Welcome, welcome to the Space universe. Show. That's oh, a, that's a good one. I haven't seen Space Show. kind of here. Yeah, so we can kind of continue doing that because as time goes on, you'll get more and more out of the shows. Yeah. So mm -hmm. seeing them all up front isn't going to be as helpful as seeing the right. things. Yeah, I mean, exactly. We go back and, and see Cosmic Wonder or Welcome to the Universe mm -hmm. again at the, you know, before the show opening, you'll get a lot more. It takes it. time for it to percolate in your brain. Absolutely. Yeah, totally. oh my gosh. I just got some bark spiral out of the part. That's <laughs> if you walk away with one thing, you're golden, right? <laughs> Current cast names name. are Sierra and Vino. Are they named after stars? Vino's rock. <laughs> the, like, the no, name. it's it's X E N O. He's oh. named after the aliens in Alien, right? Because he's all black. Uh, <laughs> um, and my my third cat is named Lyra, which is a constellation. Yes. Aww. 
Now, my old cats that I don't have anymore were Riker and Static, so those people are Star Trek nerds will recognize those names. <laughs> And I'm bound and determined to name my next cat Pluto. <laughs> Yay! You can do that. <laughs> what, I don't know if you're a Pluto what? Uh, a Pluto apologist. Apologist. Yeah. Okay. So, so in in uh, debate and philosophy, an apologist is someone who advocates for a particular viewpoint. <laughs> Are we going to get into that at all? We can talk about Pluto if you guys want to. I feel like people are going to probably bring it up. Yeah. yeah. People may ask you. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And I'm gonna I'm I'm doing a TED talk about Pluto on April. What? Can we? Uh, <laughs> oh I think God, tickets are really completely me. sold out. No. <laughs> but it'll be online. It'll be here <laughs> so, in Chicago. Um, yeah, it's, it's at uh, TEDx at Northwestern. Oh, cool. But I'm, I'm gonna, it's gonna be about Pluto. So. Awesome.